Good evening and welcome to the candidate forum for council districts three, five, and nine. I'm Dulcie Johnson, a member of the Sheboygan branch of the American Association of University Women, the sponsor of this forum. AEUW's mission is to advance equity for women and girls through advocacy, education, and research. We are a nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse candidates at any level of government, but do take positions on issues concerning education and women. AEUW was instrumental in getting Title IX passed and the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. Locally, we give scholarships to non-traditional women students. We co-sponsor the Great Decision Series with Mead Public Library and will conduct our sixth annual STEM conference in November to encourage girls to consider careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. New members are always welcome to help us in our mission. Membership information is available on our website. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, Julie Koenig, candidate for the ninth Alderman District, is a member of AEUW. She has not had any involvement in any regard to planning this. We haven't had a phone conversation or uh, even a passing high on the street. And the only emails that we have exchanged have been the same emails that all of you have received. So she d is not any more knowledgeable about what's going to happen than the rest of you. <laughs> the moderator for tonight's event is attorney Charles Wingrove. Our timekeepers are Laurie Bryan and Ann Messick. Good evening. The first question is, why are you running for the council and what is one of the best, contrib best contribution that you will bring to the council? What is the one best contribution that you will bring to the council? Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me, first a minute to introduce yourselves. We'll start with Ms. Salazar. Thank you. Um, good evening and thank you to AA um, UW for hosting the forum tonight. My name is Amanda Salazar and I am um, the District 5 Alder person, District 3 Alder person. I've been representing this district since 2001. I serve on the Licensing, Hearing and Public Safety Committee and the Public Works Committee. I am the Alder representative for the Mead Public Library Board of Directors. I grew up in Sheboygan and have had a long successful work history in the nonprofit sector. I also bring to the table experience uh, formerly working with the city as the direct, executive director of the Business Improvement District, also known as the Harbor Center. I am currently the director of operations at Bookworm Gardens. My family and I love Sheboygan, and one of the ways I've been able to give back to this community has been to serve on a variety of community boards, such as Lake Country Academy, Uptown Social, and the Wild Center. As the alter person for District 3, I enjoy serving the constituents as they work together for sensible, sorry, solutions for Sheboygan. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bolger. Paul Bolger. I love Sheboygan. Born and raised here and uh, spent uh, the bulk of my time uh, raising a family with my beautiful wife, Barb, who happens to be here tonight. And uh, it's quite a chore. Four kids, three girls, and one boy, and now four grandkids. So I've been quite busy along with my wife, and uh, you know, it's allowed me to, she's allowed me to really work very hard and, and develop a career where I spent most of my <clears throat> time in sales, sales management, and uh, running marketing divisions and running uh, food service uh, sales operations for several companies. I think that's uh, given me a, a broad base of uh, skills, I guess, and uh, hopefully I can translate some of those skills into a, an effective alder person's <laughs> role. Thank you. Ms. Remy. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the AAUW for hosting this. My name is Angela Ramey. I am the current alder person for District 5, and I've been serving uh, since April of 2022. 
I have over 10 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, a real passion of my life. Um, I received my Bachelor of Arts degree from UW-Madison, and I, uh, for the last 10 years, have been um, working at the John Michael Kohler Art Center, where I'm currently the Performing Arts Program Director. My um, partner Eric and I decided to live here in Sheboygan. I moved here for work and I immediately fell in love with this community. Uh, we have two young uh, daughters who are in the public school system and my retired parents just last year because of uh, uh, my love for the city decided to move here as well. So I have a lot invested and I really look forward to continuing to serve. Thank you. Mr. Kustra. My name is Mark Hoistra, and I, uh, I moved here in 1982 after graduating from Dort Christian College in Sioux Center, Iowa. Uh, I'm originally from Florida. I was born and raised in Bradenton, Florida. And then I went off to college, and that's where I met one of your beautiful born in Sheboygan women that talked me out of Florida to come to here. And I was fortunate enough to marry her. We've raised four beautiful children here. They all are married and reside in Sheboygan as well. And they've given us eight wonderful grandchildren that all reside in Sheboygan. And they also go to Sheboygan schools, uh, both public and parochial. Um, my children are all college educated and work in the area as well. And they all attended Sheboygan schools. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. I'd like to first also thank our hosts for putting this event together for us to come and uh, talk about Sheboygan politics, as well as everybody who's here or watching now or you know at a later time for just being engaged. Uh, I'm Troy Mitchell. I'm the current District 9 Elderman. I've been representing this district since 2018, so about five years now. Uh, 27, born and raised Sheboyganite. This is most certainly my home. I did spend a little bit of time away for undergraduate. I did not go too far, uh, just Concordia University down in Mequon, where I uh, received a computer science degree. My real job, let's say, is as a programmer analyst <laughs> with Acuity. I was recently married just this last August. Uh, and my wife and I are looking forward to starting our family in the same vibrant community that I had the opportunity to grow up in. I've been asked to ask that you please remember to speak into the microphones. Ms. Koenig. Good evening. My name is Julie Koenig. I'm here because I want to be your older person in District 9. Five years ago, I fell in love. I fell in love with the city of Sheboygan because I moved here to take a job at Lakeshore Technical College as a psychology instructor. And my family just fell in love. My family consists of my wife of 18 years, Christine, our two sons, Joshua and Hunter, and I'm happy Joshua is in the audience with us tonight. <laughs> um, we also have four rescue dogs. Um, that's a passion of ours. The dogs wanted to come tonight, but we told them no. Um, but again, we fell in love with Sheboygan. There's so much to love about our city, and I'm running because I want to give back to the city of Sheboygan. Some issues are of particular concern to me. Those include affordable housing, fixing our roads, securing public safety with more street lights, and finally, safeguarding your hard-earned taxpayer dollars. So I'm working for your vote so I can serve all constituents to make us a strong, thriving Sheboygan. Thank you. Now, the first question. Why are you running for the council, and what is the one best contribution that you will bring to the council? And this time we're going to start with Mr. Bogart, please. Thank you. I'm running because I was asked to run, and uh, somebody at church approached me and uh, asked me if I would throw my hat into the ring, and uh, I decided to, to do it. And I think what I bring to the uh, party is, uh, I guess, a broad-based experience being, a, you know, my background is in sales, marketing, and, uh, uh, you know, product development. I've had to work with a broad spectrum of people in my time out in the field. 
and lead sales organizations to achieve great things. And I think I can bring a certain amount of empathy and uh, common sense and discernment to the, uh, to the Common Council. I think I bring a, a ability to take a look at situations, assess them, and try to come up with the best solution while working with the, the, the council members in a broad way. Uh, so I hope to uh, bring uh, maybe a new dimension, a new viewpoint to the Common Council that will b benefit all the people of Sheboygan. Thank you. Ms. Remy. Her mic's not on. Thank you. Um, I'm running uh, for Common Council because I just really genuinely care about Sheboygan <laughs> and I like to serve. I like, I'm at a point in my life right now where um, I really want to help the city that I love. I am incredibly passionate about connecting our communities, about building bridges, and about uh, lifting up voices from especially those historically marginalized communities. I think that uh, Sheboygan is a unique, beautiful city that has a lot of, um, a lot of uh, just different community members, different ages, different cultures. And I really look forward to celebrating that and making sure that everyone in our community has a voice and receives all of the services that uh, they are entitled to. Um, I uh, really think my biggest contribution will be listening to my constituents, to really being in uh, District 5, holding town halls, hearing what uh, the, my neighbors want and what they need, and uh, thoughtfully uh, working with my fellow council members to uh, really actually do some real change. So thank you. Mr. Koistra. Uh, yes, I was uh, fortunate to be raised by uh, Christian mother and father. Um, I have an older brother that's eight and a half years older than me, so uh, we didn't have too many conflicts, needless to say. But um, what I was taught growing up was you need to have a servant's heart. And uh, we went through a lot of um, desegregation during my time living in Florida. And I didn't understand why because I never saw color. Uh, my family took in people of color. Um, the lady across the street had some help and she just happened to be African-American. When she got to the age she couldn't help anymore, she took care of her until she passed away, and like a family member, because I knew her very well too. So I, I bring to the community a servant's heart. I've, I've volunteered for a lot of things in sports, um, been on uh, boards at our churches and things like that. But uh, the biggest thing I bring is I have 33 years of experience running a factory in Sheboygan. I was the plant manager for 33 years of Scandia Plastics. Now it's called Comar. We are an industrial blow molder. And uh, we started with 12 people. We ended up at 125 when I left. And um, what I bring to the table is I know how to work with people. I was the human resources department when we first started as well. So I can wear a lot of hats. I'm very good at communicating with people and I'm very good at trusting department heads to make decisions. And I talk to them, I get their input on it. And when we're all comfortable, we move forward. And I think that's what this city needs. And I, I've met with some of the city employees and I, I think that's gonna be the way it's gonna move forward uh, if I do get elected. Mr. Mitchell. Let me first apologize. I don't get too much louder than this, but I will try to continue to remember to speak directly into the microphone. Uh, when I first decided to run back in 2018, I had just had the opportunity to return back home from school. It was within about six months, started working at Acuity, and as soon as I got home, I knew I wanted to plug back into my community and find a way to give back. I would say that same thing motivates me now. 
uh, looking back over what we've done in the last five years, I've been proud of a lot of what we've been able to accomplish and so far as increasing the city's capacity to serve our residents goes. But I do still feel that there's work on the table and I'd very much like to continue uh, pursuing those ends. I, uh, as far as what I bring, I would say my experience would be the uh, number one item. Uh, since 2018, I am now one of two uh, remaining members on the council that were elected in that year or on that council at that time. I uh, currently serve as the Finance and Personnel Committee Chairman. I've done that since uh, 2021, so two years now. Uh, also, the council is representative to the City Plan Commission. Been on the Redevelopment Authority, involved in the Capital Improvements uh, Commission. Transit Commission. I am sure that I am missing a couple, but please forgive me for that. <laughs> so uh, with my area of expertise being in finance and personnel, because I've served on that committee all five years, especially as we move into budget season now and whoever's going to be putting the next year's budget together will be doing so for the first time. I believe the experience in the area can be uh, <coughs> valuable as we work through 2024. Ms. Koenig. As I mentioned, um, I really do love the city of Sheboygan and I hope to be here uh, for many, many years. And I wanna give back um, following what um, you said, there is something about being a servant leader and that's something I aspire to be. And um, I have some unique skills from my years in education I have several degrees, including two graduate degrees in psychology, and I think that helps me have better listening skills. So as your older person, I would really strive to listen to what you're saying and hear you as a human, instead of thinking of you as simply a constituent. And also analytical skills. Um, I have an undergrad degree in economics. I decided not to be an economist, and I thought I wasted those four years. But <laughs> <laughs> turns out it would be quite helpful as a city council person to have a degree in economics to understand the financial underpinnings of the city. Um, similarly, I have a welcoming, friendly spirit, and I want to include people. Um, I honestly hadn't heard much about what District 9 is doing and what the council is doing um, I moved to Sheboygan the same year Alder Mitchell took his position, and I really can't tell you much about what uh, was accomplished during that time period. So if I were elected Alder person, I would really strive to facilitate communication so people know what's going on. Um, I give my contact information on my campaign materials. Folks can easily contact me if they have a question or a concern. I'm very open, and I think I also bring a positivity that is really helpful in some times, like the times we're in today. Thank you. And Ms. Salazar. Um, so I am running for um, council again. So I guess when I've, something I've always kind of wanted to do, um, I actually was really interested in the county board. Um, a family member of mine um, who has now passed away, but sat on county board and I was always took interest in it, helped him sort of campaign and um, it's really got me excited. And uh, an opportunity proposed itself when um, the alder in my district wasn't going to rerun again. So I um, went ahead and decided this was sort of my, my time. So I um, have been serving since 2021. I feel like there is definitely work to still be done and I'm excited to sort of dig in and um, you sort of support that work and um, lift sort of the staff members that are currently here also review the processes that we have so that we can um, really make sure that we're putting our best foot forward as a city for retaining and attracting um, either businesses but also other employees. Um, with my sort of background um, and a long history in working in nonprofit <clears throat> sector, I am very savvy at um, sort of streamlining operations and ha I have an eye for a budget. Um, and I, those skills will sort of uh, su support this role. Um, but also with working in a nonprofit, I am familiar with working with a, a large table of people, or a large people, at, a lot of people at the table. And that skill is um, 
something that I'm excited to sort of uh, use and facilitate as your alder for District 3, um, making sure that we're sort of lifting up the voices of our constituents, but also hearing what the employees are currently saying. So thank you. The next question is, what are the three most important challenges facing the city council? And this time we're gonna start with Ms. Ramey, please. Thank you. Um, I, I have a feeling you know, we're probably going to be repeating ourselves a lot. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the challenges that we, we face here in Sheboygan, um, I don't think will be surprises to to um, all of you here, uh, definitely our roads. We've heard that uh, many times, but I, am, I, I care about, of course, us putting energy and effort into that, but I also wanna make our roads uh, safer, not only for vehicles, but for bikers and for pedestrians as well. And I know we're making great strides in that. And as a member of the Department of Public Works I, uh, committee, I, um, I'm always kind of uh, probing that and asking those questions when we are doing um, new road uh, service work. Public safety uh, is um, a very, important um, concern of mine, uh, um, especially um, um, highlighting uh, the um, opioid epidemic and how we are handling that with um, our police and how we're handling the mental, mental health crisis that we have here, which is not unique to Sheboygan, uh, of course. And um, affordable housing. Uh, I know uh, we all are feeling the pinch there, but affordable rent and affordable mortgages and how uh, the city can really leverage the property that we have and our um, growth that going forward, making sure that that affordable housing not only is um, an affordable rent or mortgage, but is in, a, is in part of our neighborhood community. So they're walkable, they're livable, um, and just really expanding on the unique, uh, the unique sides of Sheboygan and making sure we can all have those uh, resources. Mr. Koistra. I think the number one thing I would address is um, we need a city administrator. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the, the nonsense of why we don't have one, I think we're all aware of that. But um, those kind of things happen in life. But um, I have given it thought over the years as to why since we went to a city administrator, which is a very highly skilled position and you must be well-educated, well-skilled, um, have a tremendous accounting background, and juggle a lot of balls, and have good communication skills. And we still have a full-time mayor, which is, there's no qualifications for it, folks. So most cities our size either have one or the other, and then they have a part-time mayor to do the ribbon cutting and the ceremonial stuff. And you know that's all good and fine. It's not a knock against our current mayor whatsoever. It's just something I think needed to be done probably five years ago. And uh, now we don't have one. And now we have the mayor making decisions. And that's not how it was intended to be. So we're in a very tough situation now. And I only have one criteria coming in and that's that. I'll worry about the other ones later. <laughs> Mr. Mitchell, please. So the first item that comes to mind for me would certainly be just current economic conditions as well as the aging infrastructure in the city. These two have some interplay with each other, I'm sure. Most of us have bought something within the last year at a store or elsewhere and the prices continue to go up. The cost of most city business, most city activity is going up, but there's not necessarily a symmetrical increase on the other side of that ledger. We've heard about roads already, other infrastructure. These are somewhat costly projects to keep these maintained. They already were neglected in the past. We don't wanna fall further behind, if anything, we are trying to catch up, but working within the parameters of what we have available in our budget really limits a lot of what the city is able to accomplish compared to what we would love to do if we had that 
unlimited blank check. Uh, housing availability, definitely top of mind as well. I'm going to assume that we may have a question about that one later, so I won't get into too much detail. Uh, and then the other item would be communication in general. Kind of made this one an umbrella there. Uh, it's from both the perspective of the city itself being able to communicate information out. I know that there used to be much more thorough coverage on what the, the council or the city is doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and we don't really have much of that anymore. There's been plenty of times where I've been having a conversation with somebody and mentioned something that had recently been passed that they had never heard of because it was not covered, and I guess I just had assumed that it would have been. And then also more recently, we the city has been in the news quite a bit. And it's my understanding that city leadership has some work to do to rebuild trust within the community and buy in. Ms. Koenig. So as predicted, there will be some overlap, uh, particularly with uh, Alderperson Ramey and myself which I guess isn't necessarily a bad thing. It means we have similar priorities and we would work well together to achieve those priorities. Um, so I believe affordable housing is the most important issue because it really permeates the quality of life for the entire community. Um, and it also affects employment. We are having a hard time attracting quality employers to the area because we can't guarantee that there will be housing for the employees. The second one is maintaining roads. I sort of think of maintaining roads as like the whack-a-mole game at the arcade. You fix one road, the next road needs it down the line. So it really, although it sounds like a relatively simplistic task, it's really one that we need to keep our eye on. We need to get those moles. And finally, a very serious one um, is to have public safety with a well-functioning police force, supporting our police force, making sure they have what they need to get their job done. And also um, other issues involve um, having street lights. Street lights are a concern of mine. Um, I live on Mead Avenue and going from my house to the front door, or going from the car to the front door of my house, it's really dark and I honestly don't feel safe at night doing that. And driving around the city, I've noticed that other parts of the city are also really dark and need lights. So that is a major concern that I have. So in general, public safety is something that can't be understated. We need all of our residents, um, regardless of who they are, feeling safe in the city. Ms. Salazar. Thank you. Um, so one of the, um, well, there are several. So I agree with uh, Angela Ramey here in sort of echoing so that we'll be saying some of the same things, but also um, her sort of sharing with us about thinking about not only our roads, but how we think about building on our roads for pedestrians and how bike accessibility, um, I do sit on the uh, Public Works Committee with her, so it is actually something that we both very much echo in that committee. So um, that is absolutely roads, but also the access for pedestrians and bikes is important. The other piece of that is supporting the revitalization of our neighborhoods and restoration of our lakefront. Um, in District 3, I have the luxury of being able to have Lake Michigan across the street. So really making sure that we think about the revitalization of that lakefront and sort of our neighborhoods, um, specifically my district because it includes the downtown and um, several other main parks that hold large events, um, meaning like the Fountain Park and our city green as well. Another piece to that is to continue investing in um, public safety. <coughs> Um, and prioritizing our tax dollars and analyze our planning and development for our downtown. That economic development is very important in keeping everyone shopping local, but also creating jobs locally. Thank you. And Mr. Bolgert. Thank you. I spent a lot of my adult life on the road, calling on customers around the country from Florida to um, California and all over the place and I always felt great coming back to Sheboygan not only that I always felt great leaving my family in a safe community There's a lot of great things that we have here in Sheboygan that you don't see in a lot of other play places 
safety is is one of the things that I hear constantly about Sheboygan. It's a safe place. People are moving here because it's a safe place to raise a family. There's a, and again, I mentioned there's a lot of positive things about Sheboygan, and we need to continue to accentuate those positive things and build upon them for you know, future uh, young people that want to come into this uh, community. And there's a lot that can be done. And uh, uh, those types of things, making it attractive to uh, bring additional businesses into the area so that we can increase our tax, uh, uh, broaden our tax base so that we can afford to spend money on renovation and making, uh, you know, for example, the lakefront. We got to spend some time on that because the people that come from out of town go to the lakefront. And if we can attract them and make it a beautiful place for them to visit and spend time on, they're going to come back. And those types of things that we need to build on, the positive things that this community has to offer and continue to uh, make those uh, things even better for uh, the people that come and visit us. Thank you. The next question is, what are the greatest assets of the city of Sheboygan and how would you build upon them? And this time we're gonna start with Mr. Koyster, please. Thank you. Um, the one thing I can tell you is that coming from a different state and spending four years of my life in the northwest corner of Iowa where all there is is corn growing all the time. Um, you guys have some great things here that you don't, that you may, you may take it for granted. Maybe that's harsh, but you have the best job market I've ever seen. I came here because of the jobs. <coughs> jobs from employers that care about their workers they pay them a fair wage, they have benefits, they give back to the community in ways I had never seen. And, and that's what locked our family into here. Um, that's a strong thing for a city to have. And in 40 years of being here and being a plant manager, watching the economy go up and down and how it affected things, we still grew from five machines to 100 to 45 machines from 20 about 12 people when I started to 125 people 30,000 square feet to 200,000 square feet twice as profitable as any other company our size when we got bought that's why they bought us because our owner was 73 and he wanted to take a break and he deserved it so you have great parks and you take care of them where I lived they didn't take care of them they cared about the tourists and everything they went to, but they didn't care about us that lived there. So I appreciate that. And of course, I probably wouldn't have moved here if it wasn't for Lake Michigan, because I lived a quarter of a mile from the Gulf of Mexico. So um, the big body of water sure drew me in, and I appreciate that. Mr. Mitchell. I really thought I was going to get away with being the first one to mention the lake. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, I, when this question is asked, the lake is always one of the first items that comes up, and that's not just redundancy, it's because it is true. I sometimes forget that there's other ways to watch Fourth of July fireworks rather than going down to the beach. I, we are, I guess, privileged to enjoy having it here and. It is important that we continue to prioritize keeping it clean and keeping it safe so that it's accessible for both residents that living in the city to enjoy, as well as those that do come from out of town to uh, visit the lake. The second uh, asset I would list would be people. Two parts, both internally and in my time working with the city, I, it's been my experience that nobody that works in this building is here just to punch in, punch out at uh, exactly the time. Everybody here is a dedicated public servant who all work incredibly hard to keep our community as vibrant as it is. And I have to assume it's not like that everywhere. I believe we are quite blessed by that. But then also the community in general. I 
when my wife and I bought our house, our neighbors all came over and introduced themselves right away. If I'm quite confident if I were to ever need anything, I could knock on about two doors and be able to uh, get it as needed. It seems like the tight-knit community that we have can rely on each other, and I believe that it makes Sheboygan special, and that actually takes me right into the last point, which I like to call the Goldilocks size of Sheboygan. It, Sheboygan is large enough that we have an ample selection of amenities, whether it's restaurants, entertainment, and the like, but it's also small enough that we can continue to cultivate and maintain that sense of community where people actually can know each other and rely on each other. Ms. Koenig. Well, Alderperson Mitchell and I agree on a lot with this one. Um, I too thought I would be the first person to mention the lake, but drat. Um, but I can't undersell our lake. It really is amazing. Um, little story. Um, before we moved here, I was teaching at UW Sheboygan and I had some time to kill, so I was just driving around exploring and I stumbled upon the lake and it was sunrise and it was really just phenomenally beautiful. Um, you know, not to be cheesy, but I would call it a spiritual experience and it's just amazing um, and we need to preserve our lake. Um, it's very important that we invest in tourism so other people know how great Sheboygan is and how great our lake is. It's also important for us to value our labor force and our employers. Again, it's the people who really do make the difference. So we need to pay a competitive wage to keep and um, recruit top talent. We also, as you mentioned before, need to have housing to house these individuals so people will wanna come to our city. And finally, we have our location. And our location is one thing that makes me wanna stay here. Um, I agree too with the Goldilocks, but sometimes I need the big city and the big city is only an hour away. So it's really um, one thing I love about living in Sheboygan that I can pay the prices of living in Sheboygan, having a house in Sheboygan, and then every month or so drive to Milwaukee and see more of the big city. So we need to capitalize upon our location and I don't think we've done enough of this, capitalizing upon our exits, making sure we have enough amenities to attract people to Sheboygan. Hopefully they will come once um, because they need an amenity and then they'll come longer because they wanna stay in our city. So we have a lot of resources and it's up to us to invest in them. Thank you. Ms. Salazar. Thank you. Um, so two minutes is not enough time so I'm gonna talk really fast because there's so many great things in Sheboygan. Um, first, I'll start with the community. The community is what really excites me and also the reason why I'm running for Alder. This is a community of doers. We um, have the most amount of patents that are put through, the development here, the small businesses that have popped up. Um, we are a community that sort of bands together and makes things happen in time of need, meaning when, for example, we had um, when we're talking about homelessness, the community bands together. When we're talking about a park, the community works together and does beach cleanup. I participate every year. If you haven't done it, I would encourage you to do it because you won't believe how much trash you can find in a small section of the beach. But um, this community is a community of doers and for me that is what's exciting and why I've called this place home. I could have taken my talent and have left like many others. Um, I was born and raised here in Sheboygan, but I chose to stay and work and be a part of this community. The other piece that is um, a big uh, sort of uh, draw is what I like to refer to Sheboygan is we have big city amenities as with small town prices. So you are able to see a beautiful show at the Weill Center. You are able to enjoy a pizza at El Retrovo. You're able to see national recognized art at the John Michael Kohler Art Center. We have a wonderful school district. We have a community that um, is friendly to their neighbors. And for that, that gets me sort of excited and engaged and wanting to sort of serve this community because of what I've received in return. Thank you. Mr. Boulder. We have an enormous opportunity in this community. Um, the surrounding area is really amazing. We have five of the top 100 golf courses in this area. This has turned into a golfing mecca. And people come into this area from all over the world and visit our communities. After they're done playing golf, what are they doing? 
They're looking for places to go in Sheboygan. And we need to really, I guess, accentuate that. We have so many different activities going on all over this area that bring so many people of means into uh, Sheboygan. And somehow we need to, I don't know, better market ourselves to these people because they like it once they get here. These are business owners, these are uh, young professionals, these are people on expense accounts, and they spend a lot of money. And to think about that opportunity and cater to somewhat that kind of mentality with uh, destination kind of places, the dining scene is great here, the food truck situation, the art center, as was mentioned, these are all things that young professionals are interested in, you know, and in particular, schools. If they're going to move into this area with their families, they want to have schools that are well, well run and, uh, you know, in a safe community for them to move their families to. And I think we have a lot of that going on right now. I think the council has done a great job, uh, you know, uh, presenting Sheboygan in a very good light. We just need to continue that and accentuate that much more, I think, than what we have. Thank you. Ms. Ramey. Thank you. I'm gonna echo a lot of um, my uh, colleagues up here. I'd like to start with um, um, one of our, uh, one of the things I think is just really amazing about Sheboygan is the businesses and we have huge, you know, world-renowned uh, manufacturing that happens, but then even down in our, on downtown 8th Street, just these great small businesses that keep, uh, that keep uh, popping up, which is amazing. So just the diversity um, in the businesses here, and I think we just need to um, really keep, uh, keep Sheboygan weird and keep attracting the, the, the different people to come and open um, and um, commerce here. I love our lakes and our park, our, the lake and the, um, all of our parks, uh, beautiful park system. And, but not only do I just, just love the beauty of it, I love how we activate these spaces. I have the uh, immense pleasure of uh, putting together the Levitt Amp Sheboygan Music Series where we welcome over 1,500 people on the city green every Thursday night throughout the summer. Uh, Bookworm Gardens is an amazing place. All of our cultural festivals that happen down by the lake. Uh, I just love how we use our spaces and how we're becoming more dog friendly in our parks. And so that brings me to the final, which is of course the people. Um, I, being at all these cultural events or just community events and just seeing how much culture and diversity and which we could definitely have more of, uh, but just how many different types of people and walks of life. And um, I just love it when we all can kind of come together through either a, a festival or a, for concerts and eat those from those food trucks and shop downtown. Um, I just thought, yeah, it, people, lakes and business, thank you. <laughs> the next question is, what do you envision as the most appropriate development of the former armory site? And this time we're going to start with Mr. Mitchell, please. Sure. Thank you. Hey, the absolute best case scenario for the former armory site would be something that provides the same value to the community that many people's <coughs> fond memories of the armory uh, used to. I don't know how feasible that is. That's <coughs> certainly what I would love to see, but the city is not a developer. It's not going to be the city putting together an entertainment venue or anything like that. So I am very open to any proposals that come in that are going to develop that site in a way where it's, again, just being used in the community and either filling a want or a need uh, with that space. I know the last I heard at least the question on public trust doctrine was I believe still unsettled so there may still need to be some time that passes yet before anything does move forward in that area although if I remember correctly probably about a year a little over a year ago at this point the council did pass a resolution to redraw the bulkhead lines to address some of those concerns. I know there were 
some discrepancies in historical records, so hopefully sooner than later, we can see it developed into something that both fits into the surrounding area and provides for the community, augments the community. Ms. Koenig. I see it best as a mixed use facility that no surprise here, I'm going to talk about affordable housing, but um, we'd have some affordable housing. Here's a statistic that's pretty scary. About 20% of renters in Sheboygan are underwater with their um, monthly housing expenses, which means that they pay more than 30% of their budgets on housing. So if we could have a multi-unit facility there that would be uh, feasible for people to rent at a low income, moderate income place, that would be part of the ideal. But people need to wanna go there. And another thing that I think we need to be concerned with is recruiting young professionals to the area. Our city is aging and we're not replacing all of the people that either leave or pass on. So if we could have some entertainment um, aspects of that facility, um, I don't know if this is the best thing to drop names, but maybe like a Dave & Buster's or something like a Chipotle that the kids these days really like. Something like that might be very good for helping retain young people in the city. Thank you. Ms. Salazar. I would love to see, so I, I actually was able to attend the Armory and, and experience the um, North-South football basketball games, which were so exciting, um, wonderful memories. I actually live across the street from that empty lot now um, and use it to fly kites at sometimes. But um, if we <coughs> would be developed, I would love to see some sort of um, dual purpose for it, meaning whether it's specifically apartments or housing, with partnered with a park, meaning similar to what you see at City Green, um, that would have some sort of use that you could maybe park food trucks or have engagement with the lakefront, um, like Paul was sh sharing before, getting some sort of revitalization and access to that so that when visitors come, it would attract tourism um, and get, give them a space to sort of um, spend time in and activate and then walk along the lakefront. Or we, I would love to see um, maybe possibly some sort of uh, housing slash public market where there is little moments where people can sort of rent little vignettes within the market space. And um, we could have sort of new restaurants coming in, a trial of small businesses, um, and giving that space, making it a sort of a destination, but allowing people to also live there. I would love also outdoor space. We don't have a lot of... Um, and when I say we don't, I mean sort of dining uh, space that you can sort of hang out like the, the um, Manitowoc has done and sort of Green Bay is developing right now. I would love some sort of spot where you can sit with some friends and enjoy a sandwich or a salad, have a cocktail. Um, that would be uh, sort of my wish for that development if, if that's possible. Mr. Boulder. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great piece of property what I would, uh, if we could do it, I would reroute the traffic off of uh, Penn Avenue, turn it down fourth, and uh, you know, close off that little section of Broughton Drive, and turn that whole space into an entertainment type of district. Something that would draw people down into that beautiful area. You know, and right now we have a, a road that runs into a dead end, right into the harbor, and. Uh, this is prime real estate. And I don't know of all the limitations that the council or the city would be faced with to do something like that, but to, my wife spent a lot of time going to Milwaukee shopping for my four kids. And if we could develop some sort of uh, enhanced uh, entertainment area down with that piece of land, man, that would be a lot of fun. Uh, because it's an underutilized, <coughs> Uh, resource. I mean, the lake has been mentioned so many times as just something that is, you know, a real great resource for Sheboygan. Well, that would be a, certainly a great uh, area to try to have developed into an entertainment district with music, restaurants, uh, the whole ball of wax right there. Thank you. Ms. Ramey. Thank you. Um, I was not here uh, when the Armory was, was um, up and running, but I, I had the great privilege of seeing the film at the Weill Center and, and um, seeing firsthand what that space meant to the community. Um, and so I 
will echo Trey, I don't think the city is developers and I would love to hear proposals, but uh, my opinion is that it should remain a public space. That's what the armory was. It was for the community, it was for the public, and I would love to see it remain an open and public space for all, uh, even with an idea of more of a permanent um, uh, shelter so people don't have to erect tents when they're doing events. Um, but uh, I, I too would be very open to uh, hearing different suggestions, but I think keeping it public and keeping it for everybody would be ideal. Mr. Koistra. I'm so glad you asked me that. The Sheboygan Armory was a really special place to the Koistra family. Um, I played sports my entire life. I played all the way through college. I played soccer into my 50s in Milwaukee. And some of our best memories are watching my children play basketball games at the Sheboygan Armory. You can't, it's hard to describe it to people that aren't from Sheboygan, but it was a big deal. It was a huge deal. And I want other people to be able to experience something like that. It doesn't have to be basketball, but my son played there. My daughter, Heather, played there. My daughter, Megan, played there. And my little one, Courtney, who's now a school principal in town and a math teacher. She works with this gal here a little bit once in a while. <laughs> She wasn't an athlete, you know. We always made fun of her and mom throwing in the front yard together because it didn't look real good. But she took stats for the varsity basketball games in the armory. So I totally want to see some sort of a Sheboygan residence multiplex for entertaining the people of Sheboygan so that we can enjoy those, have memories for our kids to grow up with too. And I don't know what that would be, and it would probably come with the developer's money, but if I'm elected, remember, I'm from Florida. I know a little bit about development, okay? <laughs> Thank you. The next question is, the city has not been very successful in tracking businesses to the new business park on the south side. What would you do to bring new businesses to Sheboygan and how can Sheboygan retain and surface companies that want to expand? And this time we're gonna start with Ms. Koenig. What I would do is propose that we have an ombudsperson or a concierge to work with businesses so it's one-stop shopping. If I wanted to start a business, the city can make it a lot easier for me by consolidating all the benefits and resources that can come to help small business owners. So with that in mind, the ombudsperson could work with grants to help people get state, local, and federal grants. They could also talk about and negotiate taxes so the businesses could have favorable taxes and fair taxes. Of course, affordable housing. Um, businesses can't come to Sheboygan if we don't have a place to house their employees. And in general, having good public services, um, if a business is opening in Sheboygan, they need to know that if, heaven forbid, a fire came to their business, the police or the fire company would be there to take care of it and that the police would be there to secure safety around their business. So in short, anything we do to make Sheboygan a better city can indirectly or directly help attract businesses because they know they're going to a better home. Ms. Salazar. So um, what we could do currently, which I, I believe I am, it's happening right now I, with Trey and Angela, my colleagues, we've sort of um, approved and have uh, been discussing sort of development of a street between and connecting that south, um, that south end of business to that business park. Um, so the south side of town to the business park right now, the trucks have to sort of route around. And so looking at really developing that connectivity for the, for the businesses and the trucks is really important. Um, that will sort of uh, make the land um, a little bit more attractive and that connectivity will give them a reason to sort of come into town. Um, right now they sort of have to go in a roundabout way to get there. So that is um, a one way to start looking at it. The other piece of it is communication. We need to start um, 
sort of, not shouting, but um, sharing and highlighting and championing ourselves. Sometimes uh, locally, as like I said, we are a community of doers. We are sometimes a community who's very quiet about how um, wonderful we are. And we need to start sort of sharing that with everybody, sharing how wonderful we are, our awards, what we've accomplished, um, how amazing this community is. Um, and start sort of documenting those things and sharing those that data so that businesses can understand that Sheboygan is on the map. You shouldn't move to Milwaukee. You shouldn't think of Racine or Green Bay. We are a community that is welcoming and a place that you want to invest. And you, we have employees here and people that are ready to work. Mr. Bolbert. That's an excellent question. I'm not really sure uh, what all has transpired with that development. You know, I've heard uh, last night and tonight that it's not doing so well, you know, and why isn't it doing so well? What's preventing businesses from coming to Sheboygan when we all think it's a, it's a great community, it's got great, a great label, labor force, maybe not enough employees, uh, which could be detrimental, or are there other reasons that are keeping businesses away? Do we make it too difficult, are tax burdens too high? Do we need to incentivize businesses in some fashion uh, in order to bring them in? Uh, that would have to be done you know, through negotiations with each business to try to figure out what their, their uh, uh, trigger point is. And you know, that becomes a sales job or a negotiation uh, that needs a lot of uh, input from the, from the council and, and other players and legal uh, expertise, et cetera. So again, while I'm not an expert on that uh, particular situation, I think there would be ways to resolve it because you know, why wouldn't a company want to move to Sheboygan? And once you answer that question, I think you can start addressing the situation with, with each individual opportunity. Thank you. Ms. Ramey. I too am not an expert on uh, this situation. Uh, this uh, park was built well before um, I was on council. It, it does beg a question though, if, if the business park was built before a plan was in place to what to do with the business park. Um, we can't go back in time and create a plan, uh, but I would just really want to lean in on our you know, housing and, uh, and development uh, uh, team to um, work on, again, having more affordable housing, having um, just more uh, exposure uh, for Sheboygan. And I will echo what Amanda said. Um, it, I do know, and we have heard that a, a, a big problem has been how to access that area with trucks and, and what have you. So we are moving that forward and trying to make it a more accessible uh, place to get to. So thank you. Mr. Koistra. I know a thing or two about business. I know how to bring businesses in. I know how businesses think. And I've given some thought to this over the years. Sheboygan, here again, I come from an area of the country where we don't have the greatest workers. Sheboygan has good workers, without a question. And for us, Number one, to fill up South Park, we have to make it a priority. Anything in life that's worth doing, what do you have to do? You make it a priority. You don't just talk about it and give it off to a study and this study and, no, you make it a priority. And there's only so many priorities you can attack at one time. But another way to bring them in is through the city's financial incentives. You have to do that, or you're gonna lose them to somebody else. And another great idea that I had was you sister with those businesses coming in, and you say, look, we've got all that land out there. We wanna help you develop your business there, and we will build affordable housing units close by for the workers you're gonna need. 
We're going to partner with you and show you that we got some skin in the game. Because if you have skin in the game, they know you're for real. But that means you got to cough up some money. And the world's full of money. And if you make it a priority and you get people on staff in the city of Sheboygan and make a department for that, you're going to have more money to work with, folks. And that's what you got to do. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell. The uh, final items that were passed in pursuit of construction of the South Point Enterprise campus were passed uh, just after I had started in 2018. If I could get a time machine to go back and tell myself <laughs> that even with the benefit of foresight, if you tried to pick a worse time to have a large shovel-ready plot <laughs> than directly before the global pandemic and everything that happened in the global economy, I think we, I would have been hard-pressed to find one. Yeah. So I, I yeah. guess I want to push back on the premise of the question a little bit to at least add the asterisk that there has not been much development at all in the years since that park had finished. I don't believe that would be unique to Sheboygan between just the cost of goods going up, the cost of labor going up, and now that we're starting to see that slow down a bit, we still have these sky-high interest rates, which arguably affect the cost of the uh, final effort even more. But we actually did in 2022 get a developer's agreement with, uh, or rather for a, I believe it was 100,000 square foot uh, building with the opportunity or option for them to continue adding on to that. I don't want to get myself in trouble, so I'm not going to say anything else other than <laughs> I believe there will be more developments coming in that area soon. As far as how we can attract and retain though, I think that starts with the businesses we have here. It's being a partner, not an obstacle. It's creating that strong relationship, having those processes in place that make people want to develop in Sheboygan. Marketing is also very important and then it is the environment that we have that if Sheboygan's not offering development incentives, other communities will. That does not mean actually just taking taxpayer dollars and giving them to businesses. That's using TIF districts and uh, pay-as-you-go tax incentives so that we are not giving Thank city you. money away. The next question is, how can the city generate revenue other than increasing property taxes? And let's start with Ms. Salazar, please. Okay, that's a great question. Um, so how can we generate revenue? Can you say the question one more time? Sure. How can the city generate revenue other than increasing property taxes? Mm. Okay, so um, they can, well, we, we need to sort of look at what we are currently doing and evaluate as a city. What are we currently doing that are our revenue streams and making sure we are sort of optimizing those revenue streams to start, right? We need to see what we're doing. For, um, take a deep dive into it and make sure we're sort of optimizing and getting the best return on that. Um, the other piece would then to bring sort of the, um, sort of not even the community, but our directors together and the council together to start really thinking about um, what are we currently doing and what can we do moving forward and sort of thinking um, openly and generating sort of ideas of uh, what are new ways that we can sort of bring revenue as far as what those sources are. I don't have an exact answer to that, but I am definitely willing to idea generate at the table and work with the correct partnerships to make sure that um, we're, we're really thinking about the future of Sheboygan and making sure that those revenue streams are sustainable um, for the future. Thank Just, you. Mr. Bolvin. Yes, sir. Um, building tax revenue is all part of community expansion and business expansion in the in the, the area. I mean, it, it goes back to the other question, you know, how do you get more businesses to uh, move into the development uh, park back that, you know, that is uh, available to them? How do you get uh, current uh, employers to c expand in the area? How do you get more employees into the area? to, uh, you know, fill those 3,500 to 4,000 open positions right now, uh, you know, that's an astounding number. 
once you can figure those things out, the tax revenue is going to take care of itself. And sometimes it uh, requires being more tax friendly to the businesses that you're trying to at attract. You know, I'm a free market guy and, uh, uh, you know, reducing regulation and reducing tax burden on the very employers that you want to uh, attract and continue to uh, have functioning in the area is going to cause them to stay and add additional resources to their businesses they already have and your employment rates go up and it attracts uh, you know more people into the area. I think those are the keys to uh, you know advancing the tax revenue stream in Sheboygan. Ms. Ramey. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Several ways. One, yes, growing our tax base by uh, uh, attracting more people to our community. But also I want to, uh, I, I think we can do a lot more with tourism dollars. And uh, I think we need to really figure out, uh, lean into our, our tourism, like Visit Sheboygan, our uh, Business Improvement District, our Harbor Center, and uh, get people off the highway, you know? Um, have people come here and spending their dollars in our stores, uh, staying in our hotels, and uh, spending money here in our restaurants. Thank you. Mr. Koistra. Cities get money from taxing the people that live in their community. Cities aren't set up to run businesses for profit. They're not set up to run restaurants. Even the type of multiplex I'd like to see in the armory, the city isn't set up to run something like that. There, you heard earlier, we, we gotta have good roads, we gotta have good water, we gotta have strong police department, we gotta have strong fire department. And we have to support the city workers that take care of our parks and everything. That's what the city does. That's what we're here to do. But we can bring people in, take advantage of this lake, because I lived next to the Gulf of Mexico. And when I drive down Lakeshore Drive, all I can see is opportunity there. Pay a bunch of those people a very fair price for their homes if they were to want to sell them, and then put a bulldozer on one end and run it all the way down as far as you can, man. And then you start putting up those apartment complexes, not apartments, but condos, luxury condos, the kind that sell for $5,000 a month. That's what brings revenue in. If you want to earn revenue, you're going to have to give something up. And taxes earn revenue for cities. And it doesn't have to be high rises. It can be a well-planned, developed community for people of Sheboygan to live in as well as others. But it'll bring good tax revenue in and take advantage of the lake, which right now just has some shacks hanging out by it. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. So the city does not have the ability to raise property taxes, uh, to raise revenue even if it wanted to. That is controlled by the state. It's not something I would advocate for, but it's not something that's on the table. Uh, about 30, I think a little over 35% of the general fund revenues in a given year, so city's operating budget, uh, come from property taxes. The other largest portion of that, I want to say it's around 25%, is from uh, state and federal government. I think it's mostly state with the revenue sharing program. That's not really an area where the city can negotiate how much money they're going to get. Unfortunately, it, it's not possible to increase there. Really, the best way that the city can increase revenue on a yearly basis is what's been discussed, development. Net new construction is one of the only factors that goes into not being able to increase rates for property taxes, but the levy numbers, so the full amount collected at the end. So if, let's say there was a field somewhere that was developed up into a property worth 10 times the value. 
uh, that would be more taxable property for the city. I'm very open to and receptive to ideas for alternative revenue streams that we can identify, but this is another one of those that you're seeing cities and uh, municipalities around our size or all around Wisconsin struggling with because there really aren't that many options available on the table. We, but on the flip side of that, I do think it's important to also ask very quickly the question about what we are doing with the money we are collecting and if there are ways that we could be more efficient and making sure that the money the city does have is being spent on those items that residents care most about, rely on the most, want and need to see. Ms. Koenig. So as has been mentioned, we have two options, either raising the tax rate or raising the tax base. And we can't raise the tax rate. So again, basic economics, the way we raise the tax base, more residents and more businesses. And that's already been mentioned. So just to recap some um, points, that if we improve our services, hopefully we'll be able to maintain and even increase our residences because Sheboygan will be known as a town that has good municipal services. You can count on having your garbage get picked up when it says it's gonna get picked up. Also, the tangled web of affordable housing. <laughs> One more time, but again, if we want more residents, we need to put them in places. I'm not sure if a $5,000 a month condo is the way to go or more a $1,000 a month apartment. But in any case, that's something we can debate and try to figure out how best to add housing to our city. More businesses, we've talked about this before. Again, tax incentives seems to be the textbook answer. I brought up the idea of having an ombudsperson to work with new businesses to be a source of one-stop shopping to find all the resources you need to begin your business. And since a lot has already been said, I'll end there. The next question is, should the city allow private companies to take over some services, such as maintaining our parks? And this time we'll start with Mr. Bolgert, please. Well, we have a number of great parks in the area and they are expensive to maintain. And uh, being that we have quite a few of them, I would say we should try it. You know, give uh, you know a contract, a short-term contract to a, an outside firm to manage and maintain a park or two, and see how it goes. Um, you know, if they perform and do the job that they're paid to do, and maybe even ex exceed expectations, then you expand the program. And uh, yeah, I think it would be something that would be worthwhile to try. Ms. Ramey. I'm not in favor of uh, privatizing uh, those kind of services. The, the, the moment that it becomes privatized, the city, we have no, we can't help, you know, it's no longer um, something that we can ensure that everyone has access to. We can't enforce that the parks or uh, garbage collection or fire or police or any other services that could be entertained to be privatized. We, we have no more, um, no more control over ensuring that they are for everybody. Thank you. Mr. Koistra. Uh, in a word, no. Um, here again, we're talking about uh, the, the object here would be to generate revenue by saving revenue. And the amount of revenue you're gonna save is, is peanuts. It's nothing. And it employs people in the town, which is great. And they're a tax base, that's great. It's just like with making cars. You know, we got to take the focus off of peanuts. We got to put our focus on grander ideas. I'm all for affordable housing. I'm not for affordable housing going down on Lake Michigan. That would be the most ridiculous waste of a resource I've ever seen in my life. You don't know how much revenue you're giving up and I've lived here 40 years, and those houses that were there, they're still there, man. Where I come from, they walk up to people with a house that's worth $100,000, and they offer them a million dollars for it. And then they do it over and over and over, and you gotta have developers for that. And then they run a bulldozer down them, and it looks really nice when they get done, because they know what they're doing. 
We don't know what we're doing developing, but there will be people coming after that. And they'll be glad to develop it for us. We have to open the vision a little bit. We have to see what other communities have done like that. Not just next to us, but in other states that have natural resources like this. I'm telling you, it's a windfall. I've said that for 40 years. And all I hear is, it's cold and foggy down there. Well, guess what? Blue Harbor built, and all those condominiums sold out like, right? They're gone. Mr. Mitchell. Privatizing city services is going to be another one where I will say that I would keep an open mind and I would look at it objectively on a case-by-case -case basis, but I would certainly lean toward no for the most part. It, it, the city does actually contract some services. We don't have an internal city assessor's department that is contracted out to a private company and in that scenario, it makes sense to do so. But oftentimes, because of the, I guess, different main motivations between a private organization and a public organization like the city where there's a profit incentive built in on the private side, that is not wrong. But that could lead to a lower level of service than if it is kept under the public side, being the city where really the uh, motivation is resident resident satisfaction in the first place. Uh, we actually did look at options when the city switched over from uh, the old way of picking up garbage and recycling to the new bins and new trucks. Mm. Looking at the private option, it may have been cheaper for the city's budget on the books, but that's because the residents that would be receiving the services would be receiving a large chunk of that bill directly from the private entity providing it, and it was notably more than is collected in the garbage or recycling fees, and that was how it would start. Once you privatize it and put it under a contract for however long, whatever you have in the contract, that is the only thing that is enforceable, so who knows where it would have gone from there. So that one, at the beginning, I thought privatizing it sounded like it could be a good option. You know, there's the incentive to be much more efficient. Turns out it did not. I would need to continue to look at that on a case-to-case -case basis on any other area. Ms. Koenig. I, too, would be open to studying the pros and cons of this. But a big question in my mind is accountability. The city is accountable to the taxpayers. Would a privatized company be accountable to the taxpayers to the same degree? Would they receive the city's uh, minimum wage of $15 an hour, or would they lower wages and shortcut employees to try to save money? Also, would there be externalities or byproducts of this? Uh, other negative impacts, such as perhaps a lawn company trying to shortcut environmental legisla legislation and use a product that's bad for the environment. It just seems as if there's too many unknowns right now to, to conclude that this is definitively a good idea and to switch paths. So I'm open to studying this idea, but I'm not ready to make that decision right now. Ms. Ramey. I'm sorry, Ms. Salazar, forgive me. Like, uh, <laughs> um, yes, I would also have to. Great, I would also have to um, say no to that idea as well. Um, Right, currently right now our public works committee, I, I sit on that committee right now and that team is worked, um, has worked really hard to sort of take care of the parks that we have. Um, if, I, I guess maybe I would be open to the idea if maybe um, Visit Sheboygan sort of supported and collaborated with tourism organizations to make Sheboygan a year around destination, um, then I would say, you know, do we need do we need more employees? Is there some? Is there a service that we need to contract out that we can't handle in the winter that we're not able to provide? Um, again, I would sort of echo with sort of what everyone else is saying up here. It, it's something that I would have to take at a case by case basis. Um, but to start, I would say no. Thank you. The next question is: Would you support having social workers team up with nine one one dispatchers to assist the police as needed? And now we're going to start with Ms. Remy. Okay. 
Thank you. Yes, um, uh, absolutely. Uh, I feel that uh, we are, have um, definitely a mental health crisis happening in, um, in this country and that uh, definitely touches Sheboygan as well. I think that our police force uh, could potentially is, it has too much to do, to, a lot, a lot of work to do. Uh, so to have that support to help with um, uh, uh, with different people, I think it would be absolutely necessary. Also, beyond just that call or um, uh, that that immediate event, the, working with the social worker, they would be able to do follow-up work. So it's not just, you know, a, an arrest or a ticket or what have you. It, 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 there's actually, if it is a mental health issue um, or a physical health issue or a family issue, that social worker would be able to follow up. So we are just taking care of our citizens at a deeper level. And additionally, working with social workers, they can collect the data and we can actually um, look at over time if this is working, if it's not working. Uh, so I am, yes, I'm in definite support of that. Mr. Koistra. Uh, I'm in support of anything that helps anybody that's in trouble. Uh, whether it's, uh, I suffer from depression, I suffer from uh, anxiety. I had a pretty high pressure job most of my life and uh, um, but it's all under control. And I learned how to talk about it. And I counsel people now. And I needed that. Because I was one of these guys that couldn't figure it out. And I said, why doesn't, when I saw somebody like that, I said, why doesn't that guy just, you know, lace up his bootstraps and get on with it? And then I looked down one day at my boots. I didn't have any bootstraps. It sucks. I was the last guy that you would have thought would go through that. I was the sole supporter of my family. My wife stayed at home to raise our children. Praise the Lord, I had a nice guy that I worked for. And he said, Mark, you just take your time. We're going to get through this together. Don't worry about it. And I learned how to accept it. And I'm for anything that helps people understand that people going through trauma like that, they can't help it. It's a chemical imbalance. But there's a lot of good doctors with millions of different ways to treat them so that they live a productive and happy life again. I know I did. And... Uh, I might be a little crazy for, you know, getting involved in this when I could just retire. But uh, when you have 1,500 people in a group that call you up one night and say, Mark, we need you, man, I'm like, okay, guys, because I can't talk my wife into going to Florida with eight grandchildren here anyway, so thank you. Mr. Mitchell, to the best of my knowledge, this is currently being tried out in the city. And back in October, the council allocated uh, ARPA funding, the American Rescue Plan Act dollars that the city had received in concert with the county's Health and Human Services Department to form a co -response, crisis co-response pilot program, which involves both uh, crisis workers in the dispatch center being able to screen calls, get them to where they need to go, and also having social workers actually embedded within the police department, embedded within police vehicles to respond to the type of incidents where they can best assist. Uh, this was, I think the pilot program, it's either 2024 or 2025 it's going to run through, at which point we should be able to get a fairly good amount of insight as to how effective it was, how helpful it is, if it's something that should continue on in the future. Now, the biggest challenge is most certainly going to be the cost. The pilot program, again, is being funded by one-time federal grant dollars between the city and the county. I'm not going to be able to get the exact figure. I want to say it was around $400,000 a year uh, through the years that it will be running. So it, it, 
would certainly be a challenge to find that much at the end if it's something that we want to continue on, but to me, because of how important it is, I mean, if the city has one responsibility, it is the safety of its citizens, the health and well-being. This would be one that would be very much worth pursuing and finding the funding however we can. And I'm looking forward to seeing the results at the end of our pilot program. Ms. Koenig. I'm absolutely in favor of this. Um, when I was in graduate school, I learned of a case where in Michigan, a woman was having a psychotic rage and her daughter called the police, thinking that she would get taken to, the psycho uh, to a psychiatric hospital. Instead, the police arrested her and put her in jail for a month. And she had trauma issues be to begin with, and then after being in jail for a month, her trauma issues were severely exacerbated. So um, I'm really passionate about this. It's not only the fair and just thing to do for individuals with mental illness, it's giving them fair treatment, giving them a shot. Um, it's much better than putting them in a prison and denying them any mental health services. So this is both effective for the people who have mental illness who are arrested or who are encountering the police, and also for our police officers. They're not trained to be mental health professionals. Social workers have extensive mental health training in a two or three year graduate program. So they're much more qualified to deal with mental illness. This way our police can focus where they're trained, where they're talented in dealing with cases with people who are not suffering from mental illness. So I'm very much in favor of this, thank you. Ms. Salazar. I also am in favor of this. Um, I have actually done some work currently with um, my fellow colleague, um, older person, uh, Joe Heidemann. We have sort of, uh, I think initially we were sort of tackling the homeless problem that was happening in the d downtown and sort of trying to collect information about what, what's going on and where can we start. And we sort of had a meeting, we had a meeting with the county and I actually learned and my eyes were open to all of the resources and silos um, that are currently happening in this community. This, this organization's doing this, this company's doing this. Um, and what I was proposing as we sort of documented all of it is, is getting everybody in the same room and sort of having the discussion about how can we so, so not only support the police department, but to support our, our homeless population and our local community with the mental health um, issues and problems that are currently happening and how are we best serving them. And creating a resource so that the community and us as community members have something to give them. Um, currently right now, where do we direct them? We, we just dial 911 and we expect our police department to sort of handle that. Sometimes they're receiving the call for the same person several times. And I believe if we create and sort of put our, our, our efforts together and create some sort of resource, we can see some sort of movement um, in, that, in, in a positive direction. Thank you. Mr. Bullard. Well, being that the uh trial program is already moving forward. It'll be very interesting to see the results of uh, what kind of impact that has had. You know, not only that, uh, you know, survey the police department to see what kind of uh, results the trial has actually garnered. You know, it seems like police have a lot on their plate already and putting a person in the vehicle uh, that they have to be concerned about uh, an additional person may be a distraction and things could escalate pretty quickly and people could get hurt. Uh, but, you know, if there is a benefit to doing it, absolutely I would be all for it. You know, the mental health uh, situation in Sheboygan County, from what I understand, is overtaxed the way it is. And where are you going to find the people and the additional resources to support the program? Those are, you know, some pretty big uh, questions that need to be answered. But I'm sure answers would be forthcoming after the, uh, the trial is uh, concluded. And decisions could be made after that. Thank you. The next question is, the City Council recently terminated the City Administrator. Should the council consider changing the form of government and eliminate the city administrator position? Uh, 
And we start with Mr. Koyster, please. Oh, thank you. I think I've already addressed this <laughs> earlier, but I will uh, repeat myself. Um, no, absolutely not. It's, it's just the opposite. Um, uh, right now, um, since I'm running for office, I made it my duty to kind of not just listen to what people tell me, but like I did when I ran a factory, people always come to you and tell you, you know, Jane looked at Joe cross-eyed, what are you gonna do about it, you know? So then I have to go talk to Jane and I have to go talk to Paul and then I talked to the other people that were nearby him working that day and, you know, by the end of it all, I sit them both down and I have them work it out, you know? And what we need to do here is understand that the city is set up right now to be run by a city administrator. I met with several key people in City Hall over the last month. And I talked for a half hour, some of my interviews went over two and a half hours. It's not a fun place to work here right now, folks. I'll tell you that. Something's gotta be done about it. That's why I'm sitting here. I know how to fix it. You work with other people. You get along while you're at work. You don't bring your agendas in with you. You leave them at the door. And you all work for the common cause. And maybe it's because I worked for a for-profit business my whole life, but at the end of the day, you don't make money unless you work together. And you don't have happy citizens if you don't work together at City Hall. Mr. Mitchell. I'll try to speak fast. I feel like I have more than two minutes on this one. I guess first I just wanna note, we have a mayor council form of government, so the administrator is not actually whether we have that position filled or not, the forum would remain the same. And tech, the technical term, I believe, is a weak mayor system, and I don't say that to be derisive. That is just the name of the system, weak strong council. It's when the powers, authority, and duties that are traditionally considered to be executive are actually shared among the council and the mayor. So if we didn't have an administrator at the moment, the uh, Department heads are still hired and fired by the council, and I believe report to the council. Uh, the council is still tasked with putting an annual budget together and then passing it. So these are all uh, motivations for having that administrator position, having somebody who's actually in the building every day that is providing that oversight over those responsibilities and also making sure that the council's let's say will through the policy that it passes is actually being followed and pursued on a day-to-day -day basis. There are also most organizations that are around the city of Sheboygan size would have either or both of a chief administrative officer and a chief operating officer, even if they have a CEO. So having those two functions combined into a position that requires a qualified individual to be both providing that oversight and analyzing uh, administrative tasks, functions, as well as operations to suggest different ways to the council that we can get more efficient with the business that the city conducts, to me is invaluable and most certainly worth the cost of admission. Ms. Koenig. I would definitely be open to studying this issue the big question seems to be, is there enough work for two people or would that be a form of redundancy? So from what I have heard to date, it seems as if there is enough work to keep the two positions. But again, I'm open to working with others to see what they say and possibly revamping it, maybe making one of the two positions part-time, for example. Ms. Salazar. Um, I would... Uh, support keeping the administrator position. Um, I believe that there is plenty of work for two full-time positions. What I have learned through this process um, is that we need to evaluate, um, sort of reevaluate and put a spotlight on the actual duties and the job description and have it very clearly um, delineated between 
um, the responsibilities of the mayor and the responsibilities of the city administrator and making sure that the council is, is currently educated and up to speed on sort of what the expectations are. Um, not even just specifically the council, but also transparency to the community and to the uh, city staff leadership itself. Sharing that responsibility and everybody being aware of what they're carrying um, at the, in the group setting allows for each of us to sort of pass the baton when needed and an understanding of when to volley something over to your fellow colleague or to the council itself. Um, as we've learned in all of us have been in a classroom setting, when you are aware of what your tasks are, you are able to be successful as a unit, right? So if you're assigned something and you are very clearly aware of what you are you're responsible for, what you need to communicate, that brings a successful group. And when we're all successful together, um, we're able to sort of move the wheels forward. So thank you. Mr. Bolger. Yeah, I think uh, we need the position filled as fast as possible. I think it's uh, too bad uh, what happened with Mr. Wolf and his dismissal. Um, it's a big responsibility, uh, $125 million budget that, uh, and a lot of employees uh, in the uh, community or in the, the government here to keep uh, motivated. And uh, you know, these are all elected positions. We could be gone in two years uh, once uh, we're elected, and you need to have, I think, some continuity of uh, the position so that somebody has a strong understanding of how uh, the, the finances of the, the, the community work and keep that continuity flowing. Ms. Raymond. At this point, I do feel that uh, the position is is needed. I think it's uh, there is enough uh, work to merit uh, the position. I will respectfully disagree with um, how fast to fill it. Uh, I think if anything, we need to learn uh, that we can take time and find the right person for that position. And I'd also want to um, echo Amanda and really looking at that job description and what those expectations are. And I would want to reevaluate the salary for that position. Thank you. The last question is, the city of Marina has always been a financial burden for the taxpayers, contrary to the rosy predictions when it was built. Many of the original docks have never been leased. Ice damage is a big cost in severe winters. Opened in 1993, after 30 years, <coughs> The current debt of the marina is still between two and three million. All of the docks need to be replaced at a cost of six million. The council has authorized several studies of ways to reduce damage from the ice in winter, but has not acted on the proposals, which are, of course, very expensive. What is the future of the marina as it continues to struggle? And we'll start with Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. I don't want to sound like a broken record. This is one where I am very open to suggestions. I, right now, the marina remains the city's responsibility and like any other public infrastructure the city is responsible for, it needs to be maintained. I don't know that uh, just getting rid of it and either changing it to uh, private ownership and operation is necessarily the best idea because we've heard quite a few times how valuable our lakefront is in Sheboygan. I mean, even when I was in school down in Mequon, we, they just don't have that you can get right onto the beach and into or onto the lake uh, access that we do here. It, it does need to be something that we uh, maintain. I do not like the cost of it. I would love for those books to have, you know, numbers on each side that equal out. But right now it remains the city's and until there's a viable alternative to that, it still does fall on the city to include the capital asset improvement funding necessary in the capital improvements plan. Thank you. Ms. Koenig. Following Mr. Mitchell, I too am open to different suggestions. Um, I'm not an expert in the maritime industry. Consequently, I would hire a consultant or consult with someone to give more information about this decision. Thank you. Ms. Salazar. Quickly. 
Okay, this is a great question, um, and actually something that I've been thinking about currently as I sit on the uh, Public Works Committee. Um, hearing the budget numbers when they were presented to us, I was shocked with how um, those are not balancing out and how large they are. And so um, having thought about it, um, my first initial thoughts were, do away with it, right? But that's not um, a feasible idea. Um, and so I, I'd like, I sort of challenged myself to think about how we use our marina and started looking at other communities and the way that they have accessed and uplifted their marina. Um, I think if, if you're sort of following the news, the development that's happening um, and the revitalization that they've already done in Manitowoc is huge. And really thinking about how that access to the marina is specifically with the boats, but then how the community accesses, acts, well, has access to that space as well. I think that's important. Currently right now, the space is used during the summer, but how do we make that a space that's used in the community all year around? And really thinking about maybe parceling that out with some city, um, sort of support of dollars, but then also maybe privatizing a portion of it um, and, and making sure that that public access still exists. Um, we can really reimagine what that space looks like. That just requires time um, and, and, and a plan. So I would encourage us to um, be open to new ideas and, and try to reimagine the space and, and make sure to get that sort of balanced out on the spreadsheet. Thank you. Mr. Bogart. Yeah, this is the first time hearing that uh, the marina hasn't been doing well. Um, we need a marina, Sheboygan. I mean, with the lake, you got to have a marina down there, and we have to figure out a way to, uh, to profitability for that and turn it into a money-making enterprise. Uh, you know, I'm, again, shocked and, and disappointed at uh, the fact that it's uh, not a productive endeavor for the community. And, yeah, uh, exploring options to keep it uh, you know, viable and vibrant, it, to me, would seem uh, to be something uh, that would be in the best in interest of the community. Ms. Ramey. Um, um, yeah, echoing everyone here, I, it's, gosh, if I had the answer, I'd be a millionaire. Uh, I agree that we need the marina. I also mm -hmm. um, am the, the yeah, hearing the, the cost was is still really hard for me to uh, wrap my brain around. Uh, so I, I really like what you said, Amanda, about maybe um, exploring an option of, of privatizing some of that. And But um, what I think is, um, and I think we had this in a conversation once before too, that um, having that that space uh, accessible to everyone in the community. I know it's used a lot by uh, people who are visiting, and that's phenomenal, but our lakefront is our one of our, as we've all said, most important assets here, and it should be accessible um, for everyone to, to use. And I, whatever we do, I just wanna make sure that we're uh, doing it, uh, keeping the, uh, the quality of the space and the environment top of mind. Um, and I, I look forward to, I know we're, we are currently, we have um, studies happening right now on figuring out what to do and the cost uh, of, of fixing some of those slips. So I look forward to uh, hearing the results of that and, uh, and continuing those conversations. Thank you. Mr. Koistra. It's not hard to make a business profitable. The problem is the city is not set up to run a business. I've said that several times. What you do is you do a cost analysis and then all the rich people float their boats down here and park them there. You charge them for it. And you charge them enough to where at the end of the year you're making money. It's not that hard. That's what you do when you run a business for profit. The key is for profit. We're not running a non-profit marina. It's not helping anybody that lives here. The amount of food those people buy at the restaurants here, forget it, you know? So it's time for somebody that has some business sense to look at it, come up with a plan to make money in a two year period of time because nobody would throw money at their own business for 25 years, you kidding me? It's ridiculous. It doesn't help the people that live here. In fact, those rich folks float the boats down here and then they go swim in the swimming pool and we can't use it. And we're losing $2 million on it. 
it's not that hard to figure out. If we can't make money on it, you shut it down, you pull the docks out of the water, and we'll turn it into a beautiful place with benches and everything else for the meantime, because that doesn't cost that much. And then we get some idea guys in that help us figure it out, and we just license it out to them for 99 years and give us our money every year. If they don't make money, they go away, and we sit in the park benches again and look at the beauty. That's how I would do it. Thank you. Now each candidate will have one minute to tell us what they want us to remember about their candidacy, starting with Ms. Koenig. Thanks to AAUW. Thanks to AAUW for coordinating this evening. As I shared earlier, I love the city of Sheboygan, and that's why I'm running to be the alder person for District 9. I have two graduate degrees in psychology, and I'm an instructor at Lakeshore Technical College. I bring a variety of experiences from the world of education that make me an effective, engaged leader. I strongly support public safety, such as increasing street lights on our streets to protect our residents. I support better roads, investing more in our infrastructure. I also support affordable housing, that every resident deserves access to housing that won't break the bank, and serving all constituents no matter where they live. If elected, I promise to listen to you, to safeguard your hard-earned tax dollars, while at the same time having high hopes and expectations for the city of Sheboygan. Thank you for your vote on April 4th. Ms. Salazar. As I shared earlier, it's been an honor serving the constituents of District 3. I have enjoyed working with all of you to address your concerns and issues. And as your alder, I will continue to listen to my constitu constituents and advocate for transparency in all levels of city government. Support the revitalization of our neighborhoods and restoration of our lakefront. I will continue to um, invest in public safety and repairing of our roads and infrastructure. I will prioritize the wise spending of our tax dollars and analyze planning and development of our downtown. The people of Sheboygan are our greatest asset to this community, and it's one of the reasons why I founded Activate Sheboygan, which its mission is to help build a rooted community. We know we have many opportunities here in Sheboygan, and we need to work together to devise a new sensible solutions for Sheboygan. My name is Amanda Salazar. I am the District 3 Alder, and I welcome your support and re-election on April 4th. Thank you. Mr. Bolgert. I want to thank everybody that attended the meeting tonight and uh, spent some time here listening to us all present our case uh, to uh, serve on the Common Council. I think my experience level in the free market uh, will lend itself to making wise decisions for the taxpayers' dollars to help the community become what it can become and enhanced uh, marketplace for many companies and businesses that should be moving to this area because we and the past uh, government has put together a great community for people to live, raise families in a safe environment. We need to continue to focus on our infrastructure and bring this word and tell the story for everyone to hear. Vote for me on April 4th. District 3, Paul Bolgert. Ms. Ramey. Thank you. Uh, it has been a true privilege serving uh, the constituents of District 5 on the Common Council. I have genuinely enjoyed working with the community and listening to the people in District 5 and throughout Sheboygan. I strongly support safer roads for vehicles, bikers, and pedestrians. I support equal access to city services at, such as police, fire, parks, our library, roads, garbage recycling. I support afford, doing what we can for more affordable housing and of course protecting our beautiful environment and wise budgeting of our tax dollars. In Sheboygan, we truly have so much to be thankful for. I love this city. It is a beautiful city, and it really comes down to the people here and all of us working together. Like Amanda said, we are a community of doers. 
Um, I chose to raise my family in Sheboygan and it is important for me to serve my community and keep Sheboygan thriving. Again, my name is Angela Ramey and I welcome your vote on April 4th for District 5. Mr. Koistra. Uh, thank you again to the AAUW. Um, especially uh, to Dulcie. Um, Dulcie and I had a conversation a while back and I said I wasn't coming. And then the phone started ringing. And I had just asked Dulcie last night if I could come. And she was gracious enough to allow me. And I think that was worth half of my time to tell her that. Thank you, Dulcie. What I'm gonna tell you is nothing about my campaign. When I was 23, living on Penn Street with my wife and had my little boy, and we're just starting out, I was looking at the Rice Coal Company. I went to go to bed, got on my knees, and asked Jesus to be my savior. That's what I want people to remember about me, that I follow his ways, I read his word every day, and I'm nothing but a dirty, rotten sinner trying to get better every day. God bless you all, and thank you for having me. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. Representing the 9th District for the last five years has been both an honor and a privilege. I would never have thought that that is what I would be doing with my 20s, but I don't regret it for a second. Uh, the first time around when I ran, I wanted to get involved and I wanted to be, you know, a new perspective, open to ideas. I've been doing the job for a while now. I've had the opportunity to really learn how the city operates, uh, learn mm -hmm. what residents care about seeing their council address, and learn what the largest wants and needs in our community are. I have the experience to hit the ground running and immediately continue uh, contributing to various efforts within the city and <clears throat> We'll also commit to remaining focused on fundamentals, which I won't define. I will just say thank you, and I will ask for the support of District 9 on April 4th. Thank you. And, and I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this evening. <clears throat> I'd also, I would also like to thank Attorney Wingrove for being the moderator and our timekeepers, Anne and Laurie, <laughs> and to all of you for participating to tell the citizens that you choose to represent how you feel about various issues in the city. And I would especially like to thank Scott Meeloff, director of WSCS, for taping this forum, which he will make available throughout the WSCS schedule until the time of the election on April 4th, and it will also be available on demand on WSCS. So thank you all for coming. Have a good evening.